Um, well, thank you very much for that introduction, and it is wonderful to be here. OK, um, let's be quiet for Jeff. Uh, so I have thrown together a bunch of slides. Let's see if we can maximize this. Um, that is meant to be a very broad, non-exhaustive uh, description of microbial habitats. We're going to kind of constrain the physical search parameters. Um, Mike focused very nicely on ice habitats. We're going to look a little bit more at mineral, rock, sediment hosted places. Um, and then I'm going to kind of finish with a few um, examples of these kinds of microhabitats that may or may not be relevant for the types of places we're looking. So uh, we're going to start very broad of uh, you know, what microbial life is, um, its diversity, how we define it, how we think about it, how we categorize it. So first kind of found life that could not be seen by the unaided eye in the 16th and 17th centuries when the microscope was discovered. And then people kind of drew what they thought they were seeing through there. And I love this one of this mustachioed face. Uh, <laughs> we tend to um, project what we think we are seeing uh, in all kinds of when we're looking at the limits of technological ability. And this was a first example of that. Uh, we since learned that's not exactly uh, what these things look like. If we did want to define what a microbe is, it's um, you know a microorganism, an organism that is microscopic, something you need a microscope to see. So this is a um, description based on the tools available and not necessarily actual relationships and um, ecology. So what is life is probably beyond the scope of this discussion. Um, this is the current NASA definition that we can go ahead with. In terms of what we need a microscope to see, that's kind of a, a moving target as well. That's not really a mechanism-based definition. So this kind of idea of a microbe is a little bit broad and squishy and probably not that useful. So the preferred way of thinking about microbes and their relationship to each other is through phylogeny or their evolutionary history, the ways in which different organisms have evolved um, through genetic modification over billions of years. So the kind of easy cartoon version of this tree of life is that we have the archaea, the bacteria, the eukaryotes, the three domains of life. The more recent and more accurate version is a little harder to see on a slide of this size, but we have the archaea down here, the eukaryotes here, and this whole group of the bacteria. So um, when we talk about microbes, we're usually referring to, at least in this context, bacteria and archaea. Um, there are eukaryotes, of course, that are microscopic, um, but usually that involves a higher degree of complexity, um, a little bit more farther along the scale of uh, evolutionary time, and therefore maybe not what we would want to look for first in a astrobiological context. So the prokaryotes, uh, which are the archaean bacteria, usually considered more primitive in their cell organization. Um, metabolically, we will see that they are much more advanced. Um, but there are kind of some physical differences that we can uh, cast umbrellas around to kind of categorize what we're talking about. So prokaryotes are usually smaller. Uh, they don't have the sort of traditional internal organelles. Their cell walls are different. There are kind of physical things we can look for that distinguish uh, the microbes from the macrobes. All right, so um, Mike did a good job of kind of uh, talking a little bit about some of these parameters that we are um, constrained by. I'm going to focus on four of them here of our physico-chemical boundaries, temperature, pH, water activity, and pressure. So um, in terms of just kind of figuring out what the, the search space is, uh, at least on Earth, that can maybe be a little uh, expanded when we move beyond Earth, but this is what we have to deal with so far. So we can think about the parameters that cells might enjoy and um, deal with based on these kind of sliding scales. So this is in the context of temperature, but it could be any of these parameters in the sense that there's one zone where everything is very happy. They're actively replicating. They have all the energy they need to grow and thrive. Then there's a temperature at which 
um, metabolic reactions can still happen, but maybe there's not enough energy. Maybe they are um, too burdened by dealing with these hazards to really have a full replicative life cycle, but they're metabolically active, sort of in stasis in some way. Then there's the zone at which they could be resuscitated. They are not completely uh, dead, but they are not actively metabolizing. So we can kind of think of these gray areas uh, when we're looking for um, specifically things that are growing and active and metabolizing. Yes? Is there a bottom point to that where they're not dead? Is there something that kills them? Or they just sure, dead? yes. OK, so there, there should be a fourth aspect here, which is a uh, point of no return. Sure, yes. Uh, where perhaps, especially in the context of ice and freezing, they're physically disrupted uh, and cannot really be reassembled. Good point. Um, so with temperature, we just heard a little bit about this. Uh, the issue at temperature is that, um, the real issue is that ice can physically disrupt these cells. They can be mechanically damaged. Um, the limit at the moment for that is, uh, as far as I understand it, minus 20 degrees Celsius. Um, and the challenge here isn't necessarily the activity of the enzymes uh, at this minus 10, minus 20 zone. It is the uh, physical disruption caused by ice crystals. So there is a way to kind of get around it, which is the rate of cooling to turn water into ice um, and this idea of vitrification so that you can freeze but still have a disordered um, arrangement of water molecules that allows for um, life to to continue on and it can still sort of access different things in an ice structure. Um, so here we kind of have an example of water ice um, in sort of a vacuum, just in its own liquid habitat, then in the relationship with a cell membrane. So if it is in a liquid form, we have our happy membrane, we have stuff inside the cell, these red and green molecules that a cell might want to metabolize, as well as the water molecules. Uh, when ice crystals form, it expands, of course, and can disrupt the membrane. That's no good. But if we have vitrification, if things cool very quickly and maintain this disordered yet solid state, uh, there can still sort of keep the membrane intact and access some of these metabolites in between the ice molecules. So I guess the point there, it's not just where you end up. It is the process, therefore the rate of cooling that can also be important. Um, pressure dependence, probably. Yeah, I'm not sure. I know others would probably know more about this. Um, so ways that life can sort of adapt um, or um, molecular tricks they can use. So ice binding proteins are one of them. Uh, this is an example of ice forming in the absence of ice binding proteins and in the presence. So when there are these ice binding proteins, they encourage ice to kind of stack into these um, more sort of two-dimensionally constrained zones, which then make for more gaps of liquid. So this is a good thing when we want to keep things in a liquid fluid environment. In terms of measuring activity at these low temperatures, uh, this is a calorimetry experiment where they were looking at sort of the amount of heat coming out of this sample, uh, heat being used as a proxy for metabolic activity. And uh, these are just some values of the lowest limit at which they saw this little peak that suggested there was still active metabolism. Uh, so for different types of microbes and eukaryotes, um, it's all here between about negative 10, minus 25 degrees, 26 degrees Celsius. And then this is um, a, another example of measuring activity through radio labeled acetate. Um, and looking at how much of it is kind of coming out in the CO2 at the end of these metabolic processes. And here we're going from a five degrees Celsius down, colder, colder, colder. Even at minus 20, there was a little bit of activity above background. So that is considered uh, sort of our limit of temperature. That's a lower bound. Upper bound, which might be relevant if we're thinking uh, more about hydrothermal vents at the base of some of these ocean worlds. Um, when you have more pressure, you can keep water in its liquid form um, at higher and higher temperatures. And the current upper limit that we're aware of is about 122 degrees Celsius. 
Uh, this is an image of, of that cell. I think this is probably one micron, not positive. Um, but in terms of cell counts by DAPI over a two-day experiment, um, things continue to increase in culture at 122 degrees. Um, so that's what we're seeing here. All right, that's a quick version of the temperature limits. Now moving on to pH, what is the challenge with pH? It is um, an issue in sort of deactivating functional groups uh, that have hydrogens involved. So OHs, NH3s, these can protonate and deprotonate at different levels of acidity. This uh, destabilizes molecules, especially around proteins. It can kind of stop these bridges between amino acids forming. Tertiary structure falls apart and kind of the hydrophobic interiors of proteins can all then clump together. Um, it can also disrupt the ATPase, which is a proton pump that allows for the chemical uh, currency of life to form. Uh, if this balance of protons, either inside or outside, is uh, out of whack, then uh, it's harder to form ATP. So these are the two challenges with pH. All kinds of um, solutions life has come up with, from changing the membrane composition uh, to lower the permeability to really keep protons where they're supposed to be. DNA repair, there are specific proteins that can go around and kind of stitch um, broken DNA chains back together. And then these chaperone proteins that can be activated under acidic conditions to refold those proteins, right? If we have our bridges between amino acids being disrupted by higher or lower acidity, there are proteins that can come together and sort of stop that from happening or repair it after it does. OK, so that's pH. Um, I think the current bounds of known pH activity are like negative 2 to 12, 12 and a half, something like that. Uh, so a huge range is possible. Uh, water activity, or salinity, as it is often uh, less precisely described, is kind of how the presence of water is felt or experienced or used by a microbe. Just because there is water around does not mean it is accessible um, to the cell. So here we can calculate the water activity based on the amount of water. That is certainly a component. But the activity coefficient, the degree to which it is bioaccessible, uh, is this other parameter that needs to be figured out. Um, essentially, it's the idea of bound water that can or cannot be used. So um, different types of salts can be better or worse in terms of grabbing onto water molecules and making it hard for life to get a hold of them. Uh, that's the idea of these chaotropic salts versus cosmotropic salts. Um, if we move more toward this blue and purple uh, end of the spectrum with our cations and anions, we run into more trouble under the same amount of salt. So here we have more denaturation of the proteins, uh, higher solubility of hydrophobic constituents, stuff like that. So um, keeping in mind, you know, it's not just the, the amount of salt, but the type of salt is really important as well. Um, there are, of course, adaptations that halophiles have come up with to deal with water activity challenges. Uh, there are two main approaches. One is both of them um, kind of keep the osmotic balance between interior and exterior intact, but they do it in different ways. One is with the salt in strategy, so you keep a lot of the same salt that's outside, but just pack it inside the cell. Uh, this can be a problem with amino acid. Um, structures, you often have to kind of reconfigure the types of amino acids in proteins over an evolutionary time scale. It's not really a quick transcriptional fix, usually. Uh, the second option is this compatible solute approach, which again keeps the osmotic balance the same, but it doesn't use salts. It use other, uses other types of organic molecules uh, to keep that water activity consistent with the exterior. Uh, this is a more common approach. And all of these, not all of them, some of these halophiles uh, can be seen and concentrated in sort of salt concentration ponds uh, that produce these really beautiful pigments. Um, and a really cool site where this is happening where um, is brine pools on the seafloor. 
and this one in particular in the Mediterranean Sea, the Discovery Brine Pool, uh, is caused by this redissolution of a huge chunk of uh, magnesium chloride that um, precipitated more than five million years ago. Uh, so this is a different salt than what is accounting for most of the salt in seawater. That's sodium chloride. Here it's magnesium chloride. And on our scale of chaotropic salts, it is much more in this direction. So these uh, brine pools um, where the water activity is super low uh, is a great, could be great spots um, to think about the limit in terms of water activity. Um, I think Julie can probably inform us uh, throughout the week of the latest status of this. But as uh, at last check, uh, there were cells in these brine pools. Whether or not they're metabolically active or what they could be doing perhaps is uh, an open question, but we can hear more about that later. Um, all right, so uh, the last thing I'm going to talk about is pressure. Um, often it's the same kind of adaptations that are being used in terms of DNA repair and um, compatible solutes, membrane alterations. Here are three examples of ways you could change your membrane to deal with higher pressure. Um, where you might want to decrease the permeability across your membrane in order to keep stuff that's inside inside, keep stuff that's outside outside. Uh, these things include kind of uh, linking the isoprenoid chain. So here we've added a bond here. Um, you can have more unsaturated aspects of the fatty acids. You can have more branching. Um, all of these are different approaches. And um, the good thing about studying piezophiles on Earth is that the highest pressures that we see um, you know, in the Mariana Trench, for example, or even in the subsurface are about the same as seafloors on some of these ocean worlds uh, because the gravitational force of ocean worlds can be smaller if they are smaller, um, smaller bodies. Then overall, you know, they're much thicker oceans, but the pressure is about the same. And I'm sure many of you know more about that as well. Uh, but it means that we have a relevant analog on Earth uh, that is kind of in the same order of magnitude of pressures that we might expect elsewhere. All right, so I've just focused on four uh, physicochemical challenges. There are others. Uh, radiation, I guess it's probably a big one I didn't talk about. But uh, we can sort of start to constrain this search space um, here's a nice chart kind of showing, I realize we're not going to actually interpret this at the moment, but we have salinity, temperature, pH, pressure. This should be a three-dimensional zone. Um, and based on kind of the types of habitats we have on Earth and that Earth life is known to inhabit, we encapsulate most of the types of conditions we might expect on a lot of these ocean worlds and Mars. So um, the natural laboratory of Earth is sufficient in many ways um, to test a lot of these physical chemical boundaries, at least. All right, so that is one big category of kind of constraining life's um, ability to survive and thrive. The other is uh, where their energy is going to come from. Um, and how much energy there is to do all of these life-sustaining processes. So chemical redox energy is kind of the currency of all life that we know here. Um, it fuels the reactions that uh, you know, then turn this into biochemical energy, ATP, that can, you can then spend on various things, like repairing biomolecules, moving around, replicating all of these processes of life. Um, we can often think about this in redox towers. Really, this is just the difference between the redox potential, how strongly different molecules want to hold on to electrons versus how strongly they want to accept electrons. Um, the greater the difference between an electron donor and an electron acceptor, the more energy you can get out of those couplings. Um, this is a kind of traditional zonation that we might expect in sediments and soils on Earth based on how much energy you get out of each of these uh, processes. So in this case, we would have kind of a general carbon molecule as an electron donor. Oxygen is the most, uh, the juiciest electron acceptor. Then you'd have nitrate, manganese, iron, sulfate, and CO2. These can be scrambled in all kinds of different ways based on specific um, concentrations. 
But all else being equal, uh, this is kind of where things sort out in terms of preference um, energetically. And the great thing about microbes is that they can do so many different types of electron transfer reactions. Animals all do the same thing in terms of electron transfer to get energy. We eat carbon and breathe oxygen. Microbes can do, this is a tiny subset of the list of what they are capable of, um, but for example, they can take electrons from hydrogen, put them onto sulfate from iron two onto nitrite. Um, all sorts of reactions are possible and that I think is the amazing thing about microbial diversity and the reason we're focusing on the microbes when we think about um, different kinds of environments. So how much energy is possible to be produced? How much do we actually need for life to uh, persist? Those are um, key questions that we need to calculate and think about before we go hunting in particular locations. So um, we think about this often with Gibbs energy reactions. Uh, so if we have our metabolism of A plus B going to C plus D, the amount of energy that comes out of this reaction is determined by this relationship, which is really a log um, calculation of the ratio of um, sort of where things are at the moment and where they would be at equilibrium. If your abundances of reactants and products is completely off of where they would be at some sort of equilibrium level, you will have more energy available to drive biochemical reactions. If it's already pretty close to that equilibrium, less energy. That limit uh, is also a moving target. Um, it seems to be that in terms of how much energy is required to sustain life, um, this is a compilation of studies from a while ago at this point, 2004, showing all kinds of studies and where that energetic limit of life was for mostly cultures and some kind of environmental settings. Our range, as you can tell, is about you know, minus four to minus 30 uh, kilojoules per mole being produced by these extragonic reactions. Um, and that's in kilojoules per mole of the substrate itself. So uh, we would want to know that the, any environment we're targeting, for active life at least, um, could produce something like this kind of energy um, before spending a lot of time and effort to isolate these microhabitats. It's kind of a constraining aspect uh, that is telling us what is necessary, if not always sufficient, to um, determine if there's active metabolism. Okay, but that's just one part of it. That's the amount of energy. But the power, which is energy per unit time, is often a more relevant um, factor when thinking about if life is actually around um, in a at a, at a given time in a given habitat. So um, it's just what we calculated before. This gives energy, but times the rate at which it is being produced. And um, people have kind of calculated what the, the power limits of life could be. This particular study is from sediment uh, beneath the South Pacific gyre. And they compiled the amount of uh, carbon throughout these sediment depths. They calculated all those Gibbs energies. They looked at how many cells there were. Um, they calculated the power per, um, per location that was available. And this is what they came up with. This is zepto watts per cell. So that's like 10 to the minus 21, I think, um, per cell, which maybe doesn't make any intuitive sense. But uh, it's a number that we can kind of use to constrain where our limits are. Um, and we see that it's you know changes over several orders of magnitude, even in this very sort of energetically constrained sediments. Um, so the reason power is important is that it's not, there's kind of a, there are two terms playing on whether a microbe sh can be viable. Um, it's the rate at which it is growing and using energy, but also the rate at which destructive forces are acting on the cell. So if breakdown rates are super high, if it's very high temperature, uh, maybe high pressure, then you need more energy just to retain your structure, keep those that proton gradient intact, um, things like that. So the, the threat posed by the environment is a key component that the biological energy producing reactions need to push against and compensate for. Um, 
what are these, these budgets of energy being spent on? So that can be um, sorted into all kinds of different metabolic functions. Taken together, the, these can be considered the maintenance metabolism of a cell. So we'll start with this chart here on the right, where based on the cell volume, we're looking at the rate um, of a metabolism of your standard cell. And in red, we have kind of the business of a cell doing its standard metabolism, moving around, replicating all of these things. Uh, in black, we have the endogenous metabolism. So that's kind of the maintenance energy needed to sustain the intact biomolecules. And we can sort of think about this as an like overhead for living. And it does scale with size, as you can tell, but it's less so than the active metabolism. So at some point, there's this, uh, this trade-off where the maintenance energy exceeds the ability of the cell to, to make up for it and to have its active metabolism produce enough energy to do maintenance, but also do the other business of life. Um, this chart frames it in terms of its uh, volume. And there's this zone below which cells, um, you know, you would not be able to do enough active metabolism to make up for the maintenance of actually building a cell, having those uh, cell membranes, replicating the genome, and all of those things. Uh, this chart on the left breaks it down into what those specific things are. Motility, uh, ribosome repair, proton leakage, protein repair. Um, so, you know, depending on the metabolism and the circumstance, these might change, but you can sort of calculate the amount of energy to produce and repair different biomolecules. Um, and this is a, a chart kind of compiling a lot of, of time. So um, because you don't always need a lot of energy to survive and because things can sort of be resuscitated, um, if you can stay on the good side of this, this maintenance en energy um, balance, you can have really long time scales for individual cells to survive. Um, in cultures up here, we have turnover times, so kind of replication times, essentially, of days and weeks. Um, I think these are, oh, I guess it's all down here, surface sediments um, in marine settings, where we're at like a year for organisms to replicate. Um, and then an even more energetically constrained zones, it can be hundreds of years. These are calculated based on um, turnover of radio label, um, propagated over, calculated over time to get at what you would need to replicate a cell. Okay, so we've talked a little bit about uh, growth and activity. There were some questions about this um, with Mike's presentation. Um, this is just to say that it can mean a lot of different things. And the good part of that is we can look for a lot of different things in terms of from DNA turning into RNA into protein. Where are we drawing our line in terms of activity? What specific markers of this process are we looking for? Do we mean growth in terms of making new cells or just new biomass um, or just metabolizing at all? Um, and then activity can mean different things. Are we looking for changes in the chemistry that are attributable to life or biomolecules themselves? Um, so it's just sort of a placeholder to indicate that we can look for many different things and being clear about uh, which aspects of growth and activity we mean uh, would probably be very useful when thinking about this in a more action-oriented way. Uh, OK, so how are we doing for time? We have a little bit left. So I'm going to now focus a little bit on some specific habitats, um, ways in which microbes interact with other microbes and with their mineralogical surroundings to increase the diversity and niche space for life on Earth. Um, and a couple of, of fun uh, uh, symbiotic relationships we can look at. Uh, this is a clump of sulfur cycling cells um, in salt marshes, where one cell is um, a phototroph, oxidizing sulfide in an anoxic setting, uh, and the other is a sulfate reducer. So they can form these very uh, 
pretty large clumps of cells um, that you know would because one is producing the food of the other, they can sustain themselves longer and in more abundance than if they were separate. That's one example. This is another of sulfate reducing bacteria and methanogens in an anaerobic super biofilm. So here we're looking at a cross section here of the cells. At the bottom we have these uh, methanotrophs and at the top we have sulfate reducers. Um, here it's unclear exactly how well they're interacting, but there's obvious uh, sort of physical striations and separation uh, based on their use and affinity for hydrogen, a common um, metabolite that they both want. And finally, we have an example of anaerobic methane oxidation where um, archaeal members are oxidizing methane, sulfate reducing bacteria are taking electron equivalents and reducing sulfate. Um, and this kind of operates at an energetic minimum that would probably not be possible if it weren't uh, for both of these being present at the same time and location. Symbioses and interactions can be modeled, of course. Um, so this is a study I will not go into depth on for time. Um, but based on kind of this oxytrophic relationship where one strain of E. coli couldn't make one amino acid, another couldn't make a different one, they need each other to live. Um, the study was able to color code where things are active and how active they are as a function of space. Um, they found in this particular case that the neighborhood size, kind of the sphere of influence of a cell in this uh, condition was on the order of three or 10, 12 microns, depending on which of these two strains we're looking at. Um, so I think this is fascinating and really makes the case for spatially resolved analyses because um, you know, if we stir everything up and extract genomes and reconstruct them and think that um, metabolites from one organism are going to another, that might not always be the case uh, and if that neighborhood size is closer to you know, dozens of microns. Um, so keeping things as intact as possible to look at these interactions I think is really important. Another truism of uh, microbial ecology is that microbes love surfaces. They love these boundary zones and chemical gradients because that is where the redox transitions will be strongest um, and it's where more energy will be available. I think it's hard to always separate um, affinity for surfaces because it's a surface from affinity from a surface because of its specific chemistry. Um, if we just look at kind of the physical microgeography of a surface, there are all kinds of little uh, zones that you think a microbe could be happy with. Um, but is it because it's just a physical place to hunker down and be away from predators? Or is it accessing something in the minerals themselves? Thinking about this in a more three-dimensional way, we can kind of map pore networks with uh, micro CT scanning. Um, that's to kind of characterize what these microhabitats could look like. One uh, nice example of this is these um, endoliths from Antarctica, where they are inside sandstones, um, and, but want to be near the surface for, to do phototrophy, but want to be away from the absolute outside because of radiation dangers. Um, but it's showing that there's like this very clear and intimate relationship with the substrates uh, in a way that's structuring the biology. Another potentially relevant microhabitat is the um, brucite and carbonate chimneys of uh, the Lost City hydrothermal vent. This is a um, figure showing like the temperature, pH, and salt conditions of this habitat, the available carbon substrates uh, from more reduced, electron-rich to more oxidized, electron-poor, um, and the types of metabolisms that could be happening in these structures. And this is a nice SEM image down at the bottom of what this chimney structure actually looks like. So here we have a zone that's maybe one of the best analogs for seafloor sort of ocean world um, hydrothermal settings where there's active serpentinization happening, lots of hydrogen uh, and small, um, small carbon molecules that are sustaining um, multiple trophic levels of a habitat. And it all starts in direct relationship with the surface itself and the minerals that are there. 
All right. Um, just want to check my time. All right. Should end pretty quickly. So um, I'll skip this bit. Uh, there are all kinds of other ways that microbes kind of absorb and form minerals, uh, which I'd be happy to talk about. Um, but the point is that they both form habitats. So that's all these things I just zoomed through uh, in terms of silicas and clays and carbonates forming on the outside of these microbes. But they can also destroy them or degrade them through acid production. And this is one example of that, where sulfide oxidation is kind of forming these pits in carbonate rocks um, and actively degrading it. So, um, you know, I think typically they're considered kind of constructors of these microhabitats. Um, but that's not always the case. So I guess considering um, you know, the nature of the metabolism, the acidity, and the nature of the substrate, how susceptible it is to that acidity is also key when we're thinking about these microhabitats and the relationships we might find. All right, I'm going to end with a few questions that were top of mind for me. Uh, I've kind of previewed these as we went. One was, how much do the microbes actually control the composition of minerals? Um, and how and why are they doing this? Is it just kind of a, um, a byproduct of metabolism in a way that it's not useful? It's just like getting rid of a waste product? Or can it form minerals in a way that uh, can then be sort of energetically or nutrient uh, value, value adding propositions? Next is, in relation to these microhabitats and minerals, can the microbes access what is inside and within mineral structures? This was a nice study showing that water from inside gypsum uh, crystal matrices could be acquired, and it would actually restructure the mineral itself. Um, so we're seeing very close relationships between microbes and minerals in terms of accessing things in the mineral structure. And then finally, can we look at this in a non-destructive way? Um, and this is something we will no doubt talk about further, but micro CT scanning could be a great way of starting this. Um, the intensity of these scans is uh, related to the X-ray attenuation coefficient, which is proportional to atomic number. This was a study just looking at the minerals. We can definitely separate different minerals based on CT scans, but can we do it with microbes? Um, one study suggests yes. I think there's uh, a lot to explore further in these sorts of data sets, but I think it um, is something we might want to think about um, with this group. So I will stop there. That was a very broad, quick tour. Um, happy to take any questions now or throughout the week, of course. Thanks.